to add everybody for you all to file into the virtual auditorium and sit down, as it were. So we'll watch the numbers at this end and actually start when everyone seems to be here. We're going to have a good program today, I think, and a good-sized audience as well, I'm pleased. Well, welcome everybody to the Wellmet Institute's uh, second web talk for October of 2017. Today, we will hear Paul Hanley talk about his book, Eleven, and its implications for trying to sustain 11 billion people on planet Earth later this century. I should probably begin by giving everyone a quick summary of the Wilmot Institute and its uh, history. We are now pushing up towards 23 years. <clears throat> we were started in January of 1995, but at first we only did face-to-face -face programs. We ran a program called the Spiritual Foundation. Foundations for a Global Civilization program for a total of 10 years. Uh, we started, though, with online courses in 1998 and eventually had to switch over to that completely. So today, that's our primary focus. Uh, so far, we've had 435 online courses and 11,621 registrations from now 123 countries. So we've really grown quite a lot. We have a total of 110 courses that we rotate, and we're creating new ones all the time. We have about 80 faculty who serve uh, every year in one capacity or another. Our, our learners have made un, uncounted numbers of presentations to classes, uh, deepening programs, study circles at their feast. Some have spoken on the radio about the faith, and they've acquired not only knowledge, but also confidence in their ability to speak about Baha'i subjects. We've now branched out beyond our courses, of course, to these web talks, and we're now doing two a month as of this month. We also are going to probably start various kinds of webinars, and we also do web publications. And now, of course, some of our courses are available through the United Theological Seminary, the Twin Cities in uh, Minnesota, for credit. And we're looking for Baha'is who want to acquire credit for these courses. Uh, they should contact us, and we can help them to arrange to get credit for certain of our courses. Uh, today, we will hear from Paul Hanley. Um, and he's been faculty for us for a course on agriculture, and we will be doing a course based on the book that he'll speak today, starting on November 1st. Paul has published four books and over 1,600 articles on the environment, sustainable development, agriculture, and other topics. He's also been the editor and co-author of a compilation called Earth Care, Ecological Agriculture in Saskatchewan and also a book called The Spirit of Agriculture that he published in 2005. He's the recipient of a Canadian Environmental Award, Miwasan Conservation Award, the Organic Connections Pioneer Organic Communicator Award. We'll have to hear about that one. And the Saskatchewan Sustainability Award from the Regional Center of Excellence for Education on Sustainable Development. In addition to that, of course, this book that he's gonna talk about, 11, has really received enormous uh, interest from the Baha'i community, and uh, it relates the issue of sustainability very much to the current priorities of the Baha'i faith in terms of reaching out and doing social action in neighborhoods. So I think at this point, uh, we now turn to Paul, and we will hear his presentation. Good to see you, Paul, and uh, take it away. You have to wait a second, of course, for the uh, camera to be, uh, the uh, screen sharing to be switched to your machine. So, hello everyone and uh, welcome to the course, uh, to the webinar today. And I'm excited to be here and to share some of the ideas uh, from my book 11. And uh, I guess we'll just start right into the, to the slideshow. So, uh, I think uh, probably everybody is, is pretty aware of, of the tremendous number of social and ecological problems that we're facing as, uh, up on a planetary scale and locally. Uh, I think these are really challenging, this idea that Baha'u'llah presented that we should all be focused on creating an ever-advancing civilization. And with 11 billion people uh, projected by the end of this century, uh, we're actually going to be going into some very challenging times. 
So this is the, I guess, the main uh, theme of my of my book, and I'm just trying to make my little slide show move. Okay, it's moving. So I think, in my, in a sense, my book can be uh, kind of boiled down to a couple of propositions. And the first proposition is this idea that uniting humanity will heal the planet. And behind that is this idea that the state of the ecosphere is a reflection of the human condition. So in a sense, this massive environmental problem we're having uh, internationally is really a social issue in a sense more than an environmental issue. So the second proposition is kind of the opposite, that the task of healing the planet is something that which we can use to unite humanity. So those are sort of the two propositions of the book in a nutshell. Now, uh, interestingly, uh, science, scientists have some uh, positive views about the future, some very negative, but this uh, famous biologist, Edward o. Wilson, talks about human beings having enough goodwill intelligence to turn earth into a paradise and by the end of this present century. So he has this uh, positive view of the future, even though he's uh, one of the uh, foremost uh, critics of our environmental status. You know, this struggle for existence in a sense is how human beings have, have adapted and, and survived and progressed. But according to Wilson, this is, uh, our dysfunction today is a condition of the youthful state of global civilization where we're kind of stuck in this this modality of competition and struggle for existence. However, we are growing up, and the gradual emergence of a global civilization can be seen. Uh, people are starting to uh, kind of have a consciousness of things like, like peace, the importance of peace, the elimination of war, and, and arms, and so on. And perhaps people are aware of uh, Steven Pinker's book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, where he talks about uh, how violence has declined, even though it appears that it's increased dramatically, it, it seems that our our focus on media and so on, our ability to publicize many of the uh, terrible events that happen, um, give us the impression that we're more and more anthropology and how many people used to die by violence in the past compared to today. Uh, we're actually much, much more peaceful today, especially the first 10 years of this this century have been among the most peaceful in the history of the world. So these are signs of, of kind of a maturing of the human race. We have things like the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is a real signal achievement for humanity, uh, where we actually recognize that all human beings have, have unalienable rights. So, you know, according to my propositions, uh, if uh, humanity unites, the planet should be healed. And in fact, uh, I think we are seeing some of this happening. Uh, this unification process is happening at a certain level, a certain level of maturity we're achieving. And simultaneously with that, we are seeing this emergence of ecological awareness. So we are seeing progress on this front as well, even though much of the time we, we, it's not that evident. So this, for example, the right to a healthy environment is explicitly recognized in 100 national constitutions. Uh, 181 out of 193 nations agree it's a human right. Interestingly, I think, uh, well, Canada doesn't see that and the United States neither, but many countries do. And we have these huge meetings of humanity, of, human, of leaders and leaders of thought, like the Earth Summit, the Millennium Summit, and the climate summits that have happened where people have at least put together really, uh, I think, viable plans for solving some of our problems, even though they're often are not carried out. But at least the ideas are in place. So it seems like um, there's, there are a number of positives, but the, uh, there are these two processes in place that we're still dealing with, the processes of integration and disintegration. So we're seeing the world coming together uh, socially on some levels, and yet there's also the dis disintegration of the, of the old world order at the same time. 
Same with the environment. We're seeing a lot of progress in many areas, but a lot of, of real uh, destruction in other areas. So what drives these processes? What drives integration? What's driving disintegration? Well, uh, we go back to this idea of uh, Abdul Baha talked about the reality of man is his thought. So our thoughts, our ideas, our values, and so on are really significant in this in this uh, study. And this great Ukrainian uh, scientist Vladimir Vernadsky talked really about the same thing from a scientific point of view, about reality being a product of focused human attention. So. Uh, humanity has been a very successful species, and with our collective focused attention, we're really altering the whole ecosphere. And uh, <clears throat> I think it's really, ironically, I guess it's our, our ability to cooperate as a species, which has allowed us to conquer the planet, become kind of a dominant species on the planet, for good or for ill. So we've had this, uh, we've talked about the struggle for existence. There's been this uh, incredible success by the human race in one way of looking at it. And just this, uh, this graph gives you, graphic gives you an example of, of how this has happened. So this is Earth's land mammals by weight. And you can see that wild animals are now just a tiny fraction of all the land mammals uh, in the world. So most of the mammals are now us where the dark uh, gray squares and our livestock and pets and uh, wild animals, wild mammals are a very small portion of them. So it really shows you kind of the huge impacts that, that human beings have had in sort of taking over uh, the ecological space in the world, the ecosphere. And so now uh, geologists are talking about, you know, they talk about the ages of the, of the world and now we're saying we're moving into the Anthropocene era where human beings are the most significant transformative force on the planet. So we're doing now what? Erosion, uh, earthquakes, uh, tidal waves, and those sort of things did in the past. Now human beings have that kind of impact. So our thoughts shape the world quite literally. And the outer world, our environment, really reflects our inner world, the world of, of uh, I guess, our, our inner state, our state of our thoughts, our values, and so on, and also our human relationships. And the ecologist Stan Rowe talked about this idea of the landscapes of our making match and reflect society's cultural inscapes. And again, uh, Shoghi Effendi, the guardian of the Baha'i faith, talked about this idea uh, coming from a spiritual perspective, but how our inner life actually molds the environment, and the other way around, the environment molds our inner life. So even in the uh, in science and physics and so on, this kind of concept of how our, our consciousness actually becomes engaged in this sort of physical process. Don't ask me to explain it, but uh, this this statement from John Wheeler, one of the great uh, physicists, no phenomenon is a real phenomenon until, until it is an observed phenomenon. So actually, uh, reality is in a sense created by the observers of that reality. So I just want to give a practical example of how this happens. And this is a picture, an aerial photograph of, of part of, of Saskatchewan where I live. This is the, the Cypress Hills. And this is an area that's never really been developed for agriculture, I guess for obvious reasons. There's just uh, too many hills. And uh, however, it has been shaped by the indigenous mind. So the people have lived here for thousands of years, the indigenous population. Uh, have transformed this landscape to a degree through their hunting and gathering of fire and so on that they've used to 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 shape the landscape to their advantage. However, they didn't really fundamentally change the the ecology. But then along came the uh, colonial settlers, the, the Europeans, and they totally transformed the landscape into this kind of grid pattern. And the grid pattern is all about kind of making the earth here into a kind of a factory that produces food that can be sent back to the east and to Europe to, to feed the workers for the industrial revolution. So the, the kind of idea I'm getting across here is the our way we think, the kind of value systems that we have, our ideas about the world and how it should be organized and about society actually physically change the landscape. So this is a great example. 
So there's, you know, an up, a downside to this, perhaps, uh, you know, the, the ecology of, of the, the Canadian uh, and American plains is radically altered by people. Uh, but have these things, but they kind of are very dominant in our culture. And when our, our attention is preoccupied by self-interest, the acquisition of things of power, then our social sphere and our ecosphere are increasingly fragmented. So we see scenes like this. This is a, a Palestinian camp in Syria of utter devastation. These people just uh, basically in, in really dire straits and you know millions and millions of them having to flee from, from their, their lands. So it looks a little bit like uh, some of the scenes we see in popular culture of dystopian futures. And so in a sense, I see humanity kind of going into this sort of state of permanent emergency where there's just one, every day you hear some, something new that's terrible uh, on the environmental front and the social front, uh, political front and so on. So, this ecological fragmentation uh, is being seen in this question of climate change. We're in an overheated planet. And this is a map uh, from a couple of years ago of hotspots and fires happening in uh, north, northern North America, from Alaska throughout Canada. At one point, I think it was 1,500 fires burning. And uh, throughout the whole boreal forest, uh, a huge problem with fires. Happening in the tropics as well, places like Indonesia on fire, Portugal, Spain. So these kind of massive problems that have never been uh, seen before are, are happening. And there's sometimes really, really dramatic results, huge impacts on wildlife as well as, as the center of the Canadian oil sands, which some of the dirtiest oil in the world, producing a lot of pollution, climate pollution, and so on. So now these people in the first world countries like, like Canada, uh, are joining these 65 million social and environmental refugees around the world. And, and uh, I guess these numbers, 65 million, that's more people than were displaced during the Second World War. So it's, it's starting to be very huge numbers. And so there are many things driving this, this uh, refugee situation. So for example, look at this image. This is from uh, Munich Re, which is a, an ins reinsurance company. So the insurance companies have companies that insure them. And these guys are pretty active these days. I mean, Cree has been following this climate issue, a lot of denial of climate issues, but in the meantime, companies like Munich Re are following it and, and uh, really tracking the results of climate change. So in 2015, they went over a thousand loss events for the first time. Now we're talking about major loss events and the big circles are, are loss events that are over a billion dollars in damage. And some of these are now going into the tens of billions and hundreds, hundred billion dollars of damage from these massive hurricanes and so on uh, affecting the world. So a lot of these things, uh, catastrophes are, the catastrophes are mounting and they're causing a lot of displacement throughout the world. And unfortunately the poor are disproportionately impacted. Uh, yet no one is spared. This this is uh, Calgary, the oil capital of Canada, underwater uh, a couple of years ago again, of flooding. Another huge problem all around the world, fires and floods. That seems to be the, the, uh, the thing that's coming. And now there's about three of these major loss events occurring a day. We talk about the idea of, you know, 100 year events like a, a flood or something that will occur every 100 years and now starting to happen much, much more frequently. So it's uh, huge issue. So I think that one way to look at this is that uh, these catastrophes and so on relate to the fact that we moved from an empty world, so a world like this where, you know, the country lane, things are fairly quiet, to a world like this. So a full world, so a world that's full of people and our stuff, relatively speaking, compared to what it was in the past. So there's all these implications of this kind of level of activity. So we've moved from this empty world to a full world. And you can see in this graph how things have really taken off uh, lately. So it took 10,000 generations to hit 1 billion human beings around 1800. These are, of course, estimates. 
But then it only took six generations to hit two billion. Amazing kind of spike in growth. Then two generations for the next uh, set of billions and one generation after that. So uh, one generation of people were adding a billion people to the world. So when I was born in 1952, there were about 2.5 billion and today there's about 7.5 billion. So this massive spike of growth you can see on the right side of that, that chart, <coughs> excuse me, in around 1950, where everything that we do, world population, the size of our economy, investments, fertilizer consumption, energy use and everything just took off. And so you can see in each of those graphs, how around 1950, growth just skyrocketed. And uh, along with that was a massive amount of pollution, methane pollution, uh, carbon dioxide, all of these things have taken off at the same time. So there's uh, this huge rise of population and along with that there's a, a population of things, all the things that we consume and so on, so many uh, consumer goods out there. A big one is the population of our livestock. So there's over 7 billion people, but there's over 25 billion livestock if you include cattle and pigs and, and poultry and so on. So a huge number of our animals, which we talked about before. And our buildings, uh, 1.7 billion, all having to be heated and lighted and cooled and so on. And all of this takes this huge amount of fossil fuel energy. Right now, 35 billion barrels a year. And these are the oil sands, uh, aerial view of the oil sands, which I mentioned before. So kind of a, it looks like something like Mordor from Lord of the Rings and uh, huge implications of burning all these fossil fuels to support all these people and, and the things that we produce. So now we're getting into uh, this idea of this huge economic growth at some point is no longer economic growth. Uh, it becomes uneconomic growth. So there's an increase of ill oh, faster than wealth. So ill is kind of an old term that's come back and it's kind of like bad wealth. Uh, so for example, pollution would be a, an example of ill. So these disasters are another example and you can see the economic damage on that red line just increasing and increasing and increasing. So rather than growth causing economic good, which I'm not saying it's, it doesn't ever do that anymore, it still does that, but it also creates a lot of negative, uh, negative growth, negative problems. And uh, in this graph, you'll also see, uh, you know, this is significant, I think, is that the geophysical disasters, things like earthquakes, are not really rising. They're the, the kind of tan band at the bottom of the graph, and the climate-related disasters are the things that have really taken off. So we're at about 70 billion, 7.5 billion people, but we're overshooting Earth's capacity, its biocapacity, that's its ability to support us, provide all, all the things that we need and uh, absorb all the, all the emissions, all the pollution that we put out there, like carbon pollution. So we're already exceeding Earth's biocapacity by about 60% or more, uh, at which means we need the equivalent of 1.6 Earths to support our present levels of consumption and emissions. And of course, we don't have 1.6 Earths. So what we're doing is we're actually drawing down on our natural capital. We should be living on, uh, in a sense, the interest of all the natural capital that we have, but we're now starting to draw down on that capital. So it's problematic. But the thing is this whole human project has only just begun. So we have, um, uh, in the red line, it shows the, the rise of population going from around uh, 2.5 billion, as I said, around the time I was born in the 50s, heading up to around 11 billion, according to projections, around 2100. And uh, when, I, when I was first writing this book, 11, I, uh, I was going to call it 10, because that was the projections at the time for world population at the end of the century. Then I found out that two other people had already written a book called 10, uh, which was going to be a bit of a problem for me. But then I went back and I looked at the new projections and they were talking about 10.9 billion people by the end of the century. So it had gone up quite a bit. And I thought, well, that's close enough to 11. 
And but now the new projections are talking about 11.3 billion, 11.2 to 3 billion. So it keeps going up, very problematic. And as it goes up, of course, the gross world product, the sort of all the stuff that we produce, our whole economy is going up along with it. So it's going from uh, around four trillion dollars up into the two hundred and fifty trillion dollars is the is the kind of projection. So a massive increase of, of the economy uh, with all the implications for the environment. And with that, our ecological footprint, the blue line, going from uh, you know uh, reasonable levels in the fifties and sixties up to about the equivalent of needing five Earths or five Earth equivalent by the end, end of this century. So as you can see, that's not really feasible. I mean, we can't use five Earths because we don't have them. So something's going to have to change very dramatically. And what we really need to do is we have to somehow go back to an ecological footprint, sort of the impact of everything that we do has to go back to 1975 levels when there were about four billion people. So we're going to increase the population dramatically. We're going to have to provide for all these people. We're going to have to raise up the poor and reduce our ecological footprint. So huge implications to all of this. Now, this is kind of uh, maps out some of the, uh, the inter interconnected risks that we're facing as we move forward into this vastly increased population and economy. So a massive number of risks that, that are in the, in the financial area, in the political area, weather, uh, conflict, and so on. So uh, these are being mapped out, and, and people are thinking about how are we going to deal with all these, and how, what are the interrelations between them all? So we've got to think through the whole problem. And many people think, when we look at that kind of information, that we are doomed. And uh, this is a, a very strong current in thought today that there is no future. So when we see popular culture, we're seeing more and more of this dystopian uh, reality in, in films and books and so on. And the idea of the, uh, of the zombies and the vampires and so on, there's a, there's a real sense of kind of this kind of walking dead <laughs> where we're in major trouble. And in fact, scientists like Martin Rees, who is probably Britain's best known top, uh, top scientist of the Astronomer Royal of Britain, has written this book, Our Final Century. And so he actually gives humanity a 50-50 chance of survival. And uh, Stephen Hawking says, no, we don't have any chance of survival unless we go to other planets and establish new colonies. So very interesting, I think, uh, problems we're facing. Now, there's the question of, of uh, should we be very pessimistic about the future or optimistic? And I found this, this notion quite interesting, the difference between optimism and hope. So uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, the deepest difference between linear and covenantal time is that whereas the first gives rise to optimism, the latter leads to hope. Optimism is the belief that things will get better. Uh, how, hope is the belief that together we can make things better. Optimism is a passive virtue, hope an active one. It takes no courage, only a certain naivety to be, optimist, to be an optimist. It takes courage to sustain hope. So I think if we just look at time flowing, the history flowing and where it's headed, uh, we don't really have a lot of grounds for optimism. However, if you think in terms of covenantal time, if we bring in the concept of, of faith and uh, God's plan for the world, we think about things in a different way. So without being naive as, as, as believers, I think we can have hope. And I like this concept, uh, which actually comes from the Old Testament of the Bible, the idea of I'm a prisoner of hope. Uh, Cornel West and others have, have taken up this idea even though you, <laughs> you, you're, you have grounds for pessimism, you're still a hopeful person. Now, one of the reasons I think we can be hopeful is because of this concept, which is a concept from ecology called panarchy theory. And so this shows how every complex system, every complex, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, ecological system 
goes through a number of stages. And, you know, people who are Baha'is will see something reflected in the writings about this kind of rise and fall of civilizations and the, the reorganization. So this shows, for example, in a forest, how the forest uh, grows up and builds up a lot of natural capital, which is a lot of wood, a lot of wood on the, on the forest floor and so on, which creates conditions conducive to fires. The fire comes, burns it out, and it kind of creates a new, maybe a new system uh, with different species of plants and so on, there, or there's a renewal of the system. And so according to this theory, this happens in all complex systems in complex organisms, in systems like ecosystems, but also the author talks about this happening in human systems because really human systems are social ecological systems. And uh, this author, Buzz Halling, who came up with this idea of panarchy theory, talks about how the world is headed for this major pulse of transformation. This is coming. And he says um, an interesting thing about it, which is that, uh, we should respond to this with diverse adventures in living. So we shouldn't be too prescriptive. We shouldn't say, well, this is the way the world, well, this is what we should do exactly. Uh, we should be doing this and that, because if we do that, we're kind of looking uh, forward with, in a rear view mirror. We're basing it on the things we know from the past. What we really should be doing is trying out different things and seeing what works. So he's really talking about, you know, action, reflection, action reflection and uh so here's an example of somebody who's trying something different this is a high high rise in milan where people are uh, really trying to create a high rise that's a forest right in the middle of the city and there's this interesting movement of people from being consumers only to prosumers so people are starting to really do things like produce a lot more of their own food producing their own power, getting around on their own steam and on walking bicycles and so on. And it's sort of an exciting movement that's happening all over the world. Like for example, in my city, I was, I was promoting, you know, 20, 30 years ago, the idea of urban agriculture and nobody seemed interested. Suddenly there's like community gardens all over the city and schools are growing gardens, kids are growing gardens, people are growing things, growing fruit trees and so on. So there's this big, big change. And uh, we're starting to see really exciting uh, adventures in sustainable urban designs, whole neighborhoods that are becoming uh, carbon neutral and so on. 800 million people, they say, involved in urban gardening, uh, farming. And so a lot of potential there to grow food in cities and so on, become more food resilient. Countries like Germany uh, changing their energy system. I just was reading this morning an article about how Germany is producing so much renewable power that they're having a problem because they, they can't use enough of it. So they're going to start to pay people to use power, if you can imagine that. So, uh, you know, there's a sense, well, you can never produce enough power using renewable sources, but apparently that isn't the case. So one of the things I, I've, in my book 11, I talk about all these wonderful things that are happening around the world, these adventures in living. And it seems like the, everything that we need to do to make an 11 billion world work is being done somewhere already successfully. So that's encouraging. But the discouraging part is that they're not being, really being adopted universally. They're more like uh, prototypes here and there, but not uh, really being adopted by the mainstream of society. So this brings us to the question of how do we change? And I think more and more, people are realizing that the political approach to uh, the different problems that we're facing today is really inadequate uh, and more and more that seems possible and I think that's reflected by perhaps how few people really engage in the political process maybe other than complaining uh, but they don't get involved in elections like turnouts to elections are very very low and so on. So what we're really talking about and I think I've, I've sort of built the case for this, we really need transformation on an unprecedented scale. So we need a new culture, we need a new agriculture, and we need really, ultimately, a new human race. We need to transform completely if we're gonna live together in a peaceful way, 11 billion of us on this one small planet. And I think uh, behind all this is the need for a real ethical revolution. 
So uh, this is just a, a diagram that seems to uh, show kind of where people, what people value. And it seems right now most of our value is on things which are rather unnecessary and even destructive. So uh, what we value a lot is consumption, things like fashions and so on. We have huge resources go into our military, into conflict, preparing for conflicts and a great deal of uh, focus on addictions of various sorts, uh, which really have a huge detrimental impact on society. So this is a, uh, just a chart I put together of what I call wasted wealth. So some of the things that we focus our attention on uh, here are, are really destructive, and a lot of our wealth goes into these things. So once again, like for example, some of the vices like gambling, prostitution, pornography, $600 billion a year spent on those things. And that's just the smallest one. We get to consumer goods for the consumer goods bought by the top 20 human needs for everyone. And these other things uh, kind of fell away to a certain degree. Perhaps they'll always be there to some degree, but why should they be uh, take up so much of our attention? So this would release a, release a huge amount of wealth for reconstructing civilization and restoring the ecosphere. So right values really help us focus human attention on unified action. And there's this idea that ideas transform landscapes. So I'm gonna uh, show a video now of this uh, Los Plateau in China, where people have come together, brought their ideas together, their work together, their attention, and see what the results are. So we're just gonna show this uh, video now. China's Los Plateau is a region that stretches for 640,000 square kilometers across North Central China. Unspoiled valleys in neighboring Sichuan show us how it might once have looked. It's the sort of natural abundance that is necessary to support an emerging civilization. How could a landscape with such potential have been reduced to this? When Chinese scientists and civil engineers began to survey the area, they realized that several thousand years of agricultural exploitation had denuded the hills and valleys of vegetation. The relentless grazing of domestic animals on the slopes meant that there was no chance for young trees and shrubs to grow. The rainfall no longer seeped into the earth, but simply washed down the hillsides, taking the soil with it. Over millennia, this progressively destroyed the region's fertility. <coughs> when this happens over an area as extensive as the plateau, millions of tons of silt are swept down into the Yellow River. When I first filmed Mr. Ta Fu Yuan and his colleagues back in 1995, I had no idea this initiative could achieve such dramatic results. The effort that people put into converting their slopes into terraces has resulted in a marked increase in agricultural productivity. The higher yields... The retention on these things, the potential is really quite fantastic. So our collective fo focused uh, human attention is really important and our unity of thought can actually uh, change the world in, in very dramatic ways as we see in this example in China. So what we need to do is really look at, we, we talked before about the great acceleration, we need to, a great deceleration in terms of our, our economic growth. We need to learn to avoid certain things that we've done and shift certain things. So avoid uh, industries and so on that, that create a lot of pollution and shift, for example, our energy system from, uh, from the fossil fuel system to renewables and those kind of things. 
have to be done and really adopted on a massive scale. In agriculture, uh, this is critically important. The area of our food, so all these new people and the hungry can be fed that already exist. But what we're finding is that, uh, you know, most of the new population in the world that's coming will be in these low income countries where most of the farms are very small. There's about 2.5 billion small farmers and their families. And so this is really the type of, in order to feed people, I think rather than increasing production in, in countries like Canada, the US or Europe, uh, th there needs to be systems in place that really help, help the, these small farmers produce for their local populations, which is where the, the growth in population will be. So things like agroecology have been found to be very productive and it follows ecological, ec the ecological model. And carbon, carbon farming is, is another uh, potential. Uh, so where you're, you're trying to grow crops that will absorb a lot of carbon out of the atmosphere and help to deal with, uh, with uh, the whole issue of climate change. And there's a huge amount of potential in agriculture to do this. So we need to focus our attention on restoring the ecosphere. And interestingly, about 3.5 billion hectares of land are degraded in the world. So a huge amount that would be larger than the size of the African continent. So if we can support the world uh, poor to restore land, it, it sort of has multiple benefits. One is uh, helping to transfer some of the wealth to these people so that they can, can restore their landscapes. We're talking about maybe uh, uh, as little as $50 a year for some of these small farmers could really help them on the road to change uh, if we uh, focus some green payments on, on their work could help to eliminate poverty and hunger at that scale, increase their earth's biocapacity, ameliorate climate change, and avoid this problem of, of uh, a migration of people off the land. In a sense, it would be equivalent to creating a new continent. So now into this idea of transformational processes, how can we you know, help this to happen? I like this quote from Buckminster Fuller, you never change things by fighting the existing reality to change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Interesting. So what are steps to transformation? Well, I think probably the first one is just the capacity to actually know what's going on. So we have a world, I think in many ways is in denial. We, we don't accept the situation that we're in, the ecological uh, reality that we're, we're living in and the impact of what we're doing. So we need to really read our reality. We need to develop unity of thought and develop a better balance of material uh, goals and spiritual, uh, the spiritual aspirations of people. So for example, we can develop our inner life, our relationships, and have them more the center of our value system than just the material. The capacity for service is very important and having an action orientation. So for example, World leaders are meeting and they have climate summits and so on and, and plans are put in place, but often no action takes place. So we have to really move to an action orientation. And the, the, the process we develop has to be really systematic, but it also has to be planet wide. It has to happen everywhere. And it has to involve individuals, communities and institutions. So there are a number of examples I talk about in my book where we're really trying to build this new kind of cultural, ecological ethos, the Millennium Villages projects in Africa, for example. I talk about the Harlem Children's Zone, which is an example in, in, uh, in a wealthy country. <coughs> Excuse me. So these are, are ways people are trying to, to do these diverse adventures of living that I talked about and, and try and make a change. However, one of the problems with this is uh, some of these mo modes of are really looking at increasing people's material well-being. So if, if these processes uh, succeed and bring people uh, in additional material wealth, which I'm not opposing, but if they just become part of this middle class and become consumers, we just have a bigger problem than we had before. It's, it's just a different problem. Uh, so. What we need is really different approach entirely. And that's where I think this idea of the Ruhi Institute, this change uh, process uh, 
comes into place. So it's, uh, as of course, many of you are involved in it, I know, and it's a global movement uh, of cultural transformation through education. It's grassroots, uh, it's worldwide, and it's about really changing our culture. It addresses the spiritual as well as the material, which I think is really critical. If we just focus on improving people's life materially without looking at the spiritual, we're getting deeper and deeper into this ecological problem. It operates at the local level, but I think really importantly, there are these global feedback loops. So people all over the world share information, they share it regionally, they share it internationally, and then what we're, the learning can be reflected back on people to, to help accelerate the process. And I think another thing that's really important about it is it's not just the idea of uh, development for the poor. I think it's development for all human beings. And the cause of most of the problems in the world, uh, if we look at the ecosystems at least, are the middle income and rich people. So they really have to change their lifestyles. And I think this, uh, this really, Institute really addresses everyone. It also uh, addresses all age groups, which is really important too, because we found that children and youth are, are important change agents. So this is just a, a graphic I put together of this whole process. Uh, and it's, it's kind of a, a complex uh, transformative process, but I think has been found to be very effective in a number of places. So I wanna just uh, show you a clip out of the Frontiers of Learning uh, it's just about five minutes and that will end up my presentation and it shows um, I think if you kind of think of what I've been saying throughout and look how this community is going through this transformative process and applying some of the learning that that uh, how how they're actually starting to change their culture and by changing the culture they're starting to have some impacts on the unnatural environment as well so we'll just watch that uh, now. भारत के उत्तर पूर्व दिशा में बिहार स्थित है। यहाँ पे गौतम बुद्ध आए और अपना ज्ञान अर्जन किया। बिहार से क्लस्टर में 6000 ऐसे लोग होंगे जो समुदाय निर्माण में अपना योगदान दे रहे हैं पिछले कुछ साल में लगभग 1000 से ज्यादा किशोर हैं जो किशोर कार्यक्रम से गुजर चुके हैं हमारे किशोर समूह का नाम सत्यबारिता है आज हम सब पर्यावरण के शुद्धता के लिए वृक्षारोपण करने जा रहे हैं लगभग 900 के आसपास में ऐसे बच्चे हैं जो बच्चों के कार्यक्रम से गुजर चुके हैं और लगभग 500 ऐसे व्यस्क हैं जो संस्थान प्रक्रिया से गुजर चुके हैं साठ प्रार्थनाएं सभा को संचालित किया जा रहा है सभी आते हैं और उत्साह के साथ भाग लेते हैं और उनसे प्रेरणा पाते हैं इन सब गतिविधियों की वजह से व्यक्ति की समुदाय और संस्थाओं में गहरा बदलाव आ रहे हैं संस्कृति के स्तर पे बहुत सारी बदलाव आ रहे हैं जिसकी वजह से सदियों से चली आ रही पूर्वाग्रहों से लोग धीरे-धीरे मुक्त हो रहे हैं हमारे भारत देश में जाति प्रथा की जो भेदभाव है बहुत गहन रूप से जकाल रखा है यह एक सामाजिक बनावटी व्यवस्था है उच्च जाति और निम्न जाति के लोग आपस में ना घुल मिल पाते हैं ना बैठ पाते हैं ना बातें कर पाते हैं ना साथ में खाना खा पाते हैं जिस रूही बन पढ़ने से मेरा अच्छा बहुत दिमाग खुला उसे सीख मिलता है कि जाति प्रथा नहीं हो सकता है समाज अभी देखते हैं तो बहुत खुशी आनंद लगता है भरे जा दुख किसी को भोग नहीं पड़ता है पहले लोग बोलते थे कि मैंने अलग-अलग जात घर में नहीं आना चाहिए 
बाहर आना चाहिए दूर भाव करना चाहिए जब स्टेटिंग सर्किल के साथ हम लोग जुटे तो हम लोग के भेदभाव के नाम मिट जाने के लगा और स्वागत करने के लिए हम लोग आमंत्रित रहते हैं अपने बच्चे को प्रवेश करते हुए हम निर्णय लिया कि हमने नहीं बताएं कि किस जाति का है ताकि उसको मन में विचार नहीं आएगा कि वो ऊंचा है या नीचा और न ही सामने वाले को ऊंची या नीचे नजर से देख पाए सभी को समान नजर से देख पाए हमारे संस्कृति में वयस्क और युवाओं के बीच काफी दूरियां थी पहले देखिए जो बुजुर्ग लोग अक्सर हम उन्हें कुछ बोल देते थे तो युवा लोग को मान लेवे पड़ता था लेकिन संस्थान प्रक्रिया आने से काफी बदलाव हुआ अब हम लोग के अवसर मिल रहा है कि एक साथ बैठ करके युवा और बुजुर्ग लोग दोनों मिलकर परामर्श करते हैं और फिर परामर्श करके ही निर्णय लेते हैं कि महिलाओं को कभी भी निर्णय लेने का अधिकार नहीं दिया जाता है उनकी क्षमताओं को हमेशा कम करके आका जाता है साथ ही लड़कियों को बहुत ही कम उम्र में उनकी शादियां कर दिया जाता है वहां पे लड़कियों की कोई इच्छा नहीं चलता है वहां पे कोई निर्णय लड़कियों से नहीं लिया जाता है कोई परामर्श उनके साथ नहीं किया जाता है हमारे पापा जी जो थे जो कम ही एज में शादी कर दिए थे तो इस तरह से हमें पहले कुछ नहीं महसूस होता था कि शादी क्या है और जब फिर हम यहाँ आए तो देखे कि घर से बाहर नहीं निकलना है हमको मतलब घर के अंदर ही रहना पड़ता था तो कोई आए थे तो बोले कि इस तरह का बुक है आप करना चाहते हैं मेरी सास किसी तरह से तैयार हुई अपना हस्बैंड से भी पूछे तो इस तरह से मैं बुक की पूरे जब से हम इस संस्थान में जुड़ी हूँ हम देखते हैं कि बहुत बदलाव आ रहा है बंधन भी टूट गया है यहाँ पर संस्कृति में कि लड़कियों को घर से निकलने के लिए नहीं दिया जाता है हम सिर्फ स्कूल से घर घर से स्कूल जाते थे लेकिन जैसे कि हम संस्थान प्रक्रिया में आए हमें बाहर जाने का मौका मिला अब हम चुनिवृत कोऑर्डिनेटर के रूप में सेवा दे रहे हैं हम अपने गांव में भी एक ग्रुप भेज करते हैं और अलग अलग गांव में भी ये हम जाते हैं वहाँ पर भी ये ग्रुप विजिट करते हैं और हम एनिमेटर के साथ बात करते हैं ग्रुप के बारे में भी और एक दूसरे के साथ मित्रता बन गया है यहाँ पर संस्कृति में गार्जियन तय करते हैं कि कौन किससे हम बेटी का शादी हो और लड़की का कौन मर्जी नहीं लिया जाता है गाँव में हम देखते हैं कि लड़कियों को शादी बारह तेरह साल में हो जाता है हमको शादी हुआ था तो हम बारह साल के थे हम पति के कभी देखे थे नहीं हम अपना बेटी के काम उम्र में नहीं करने के लिए सोते थे हमको रिभा बेटी अपना पसंद करने के बाद माता पिता से राय ले ली उसको बाद शादी की है हमारे यहाँ एक नई सभ्यता एक नई संस्कृति उत्पन्न हुआ है जो है लोग शिक्षा के प्रति जागरूक हुए हैं ऊंच नीच का जो है भेद कम हुआ है कि जो है महिलाओं को सम्मान पहले से ज्यादा मिलता है अब लड़कियों का जो है कम उम्र में शादी होना कम हो गया है तो इस तरह से जो है नई संस्कृति का जो है चलन हुआ है सो आई थिंक दैट्स एन अपॉर्चुनिटी टू काइंड ऑफ get a glimpse of what perhaps some of this uh cultural change uh can achieve um now you might say now how do how does this sort of change address the ecological issues well, i'll give you a couple of examples one is this issue of the status of women so wherever in the world the status of women has increased uh the uh birth rate has gone down so obviously we have to at some point achieve zero population growth and if uh if we don't do that we're really in trouble uh so the raising of the status of women has a direct impact on the environment uh i saw a study that said if there's anything you can do to reduce environmental impacts it's have one less child so uh 
there's an example. The other one uh, I think is quite interesting is this idea of changing the caste system, uh, the idea of caste prejudice. Uh, I, I remember hearing that uh, Pre uh, Prime Minister Modi of India asked the uh, civil service to go out and clean up because there's a huge problem with, in India of, of just uh, trash and pollution all over the place. And people weren't willing to do it because only lower castes could clean things up. So even the concept of of changing the caste uh, system would be very, very significant in terms of transformation of culture and the impacts on the environment. So those are just a couple of examples. Now, uh, probably most of us are in Canada or the United States, and our the set of problems we're dealing with may be somewhat different. But uh, whatever it is, we have to look at it and make the change. So I guess the idea is just to really to elevate conversations to really promote ethical education and service orientation and all of these things are kind of the initial steps towards social change that uh, we're working on. So just to finish up here, the ideas uh, to start it off were that human unity is a pre prerequisite for reintegrating the ecosphere and that uh, changing our inner world and our relationships changes the outer world and that this sort of process of healing the planet will really actually help us to unite too. So there's a two-way two, two -way street here. So those are the ideas I'd like to share. I think I'm in within an hour, exactly. And um, just to say that uh, there's going to be a, uh, a course on, on, on this book and, and many other things related to it, started by the Wilmot Institute this week. So if you're interested in this, please check that out as well. Now, if you do want to get my book, you can find it on online stores and so on. So. Thank you very much, Paul. That was fantastic. Thank and uh, really intriguing too, because it gives us a good sense of the, the challenges humanity now faces. I, I had not really realized that we were heading towards needing five Earths. Uh, and if for that matter, even that we're 1.6 Earths now, that's really quite a frightening statistic. And it does make you wonder how we're going to uh, back ourselves out of this uh, uh, crisis. Uh, we do have a few questions and let me pop them up here. Shahla asks this very interesting question. When we say violence is decreasing, is it relative to the size of the population and how is violence defined? Uh, yeah, I was talking about Steven Pinker's book, uh, Better Angels of Our Nature. So he kind of looks at um, statistics and he talks, he looks at from archaeology, they can find out how many people died from injuries like head injuries and so on uh, in, in earlier states of civilization. And then there was efforts to start keeping statistics on deaths and the cause of death. Uh, in, in a number of different countries starting in the, I think maybe 18th, 19th century and so on. And as a percentage of, of population, the number of deaths by violence is going down. Number of uh, violence, uh, even violence against women and so on is decreased. Uh, although obviously it seems, seems very opposite, but I think when things get, the light gets brighter, the shadows get deeper. When we see, uh, things may improve, but then any example of a problem becomes much more significant to us. So when we have, for example, the idea of human rights, now we recognize that people in the past, our ancestors may have seen as worthless. Now we see them as worth, ha as having worth. Then if there's an injury to them, we, we see that as a, as a really negative thing. And so it gives us the impression that violence is increasing, but Actually, the science seems to indicate that it is not. Yeah, it seems to me I had read once that anthropologists have studied the sand people, of the so-called the Bushmen of, of Botswana, and they typically live in family or clan groups, but when they get together once a year as a whole tribe of four or 500 people, they just don't know how to live together as four or 500 people because they never do it. And so there's a lot higher chance of murders and, and other kinds of, of violence when the whole tribe gets together, they don't have laws, they don't have police, they don't have judges, and they don't have the mechanisms that we have uh, well, in 
societies. That's an example that I've heard. Anyway. Yeah, I think in, in Europe, uh, there was war pretty much continuously for several hundred years uh, until into the 19th century. And even in, of course, the 20th century, these massive wars that started in Europe. And uh, so, but now Europe is basically, relatively speaking, a very peaceful place. Sure. The, there's a, another question here. Um, well, uh, Pergea says, thank, it doesn't, she doesn't have a, words to express my appreciation for this webinar. Thank you so much. Uh, Elahe echoes her wonderful talk, may we use the YouTube of this presentation at our local Baha'i centers? And the answer to that, of course, is once we've got it on YouTube, it's on YouTube, anyone can use it. And this is one of the reasons the Wilmot Institute provides these web talks. We want to encourage everybody to replay them, use them in uh, public settings, private settings, whatever. And, and, and this particular one, I think, is a, a good example of why we want to do that. People need to know about the situation and the the possibilities for the future. Um, we have another question here also. Um, oh, so I made it go away here accidentally. Um, it sounds as though no population growth, sounds as though you are promoting no population growth, but what exactly do you mean since it is counter to the Baha'i position, all religions and human nature in general? I'm not sure how it's counter, but at any rate, what do you think about no population growth? Well, I think zero population growth doesn't mean that there's no more babies. It means that there, uh, I, I think the, you know, really what we need to get to is, is basically around uh, two children per fertile woman. And so you'd still be having fam children and families, but you'd, it's when you go above that, uh, that you start to have this continuous increase. And so uh, actually this is happening pretty well everywhere in the world. The population rate is is uh, decrease. The population growth rate is decreasing down towards zero population growth. Uh, but there are a few places which are exceptions. For example, I was shocked by Nigeria, which, uh, according to the projections, would become the third most populous country in the world by the end of the century, with 900 million people, uh, and it's about a tenth the size of China. So certain there's there's a number of countries like about ten countries that are not decreasing their population growth rate or at least not very much and so they're really critically important I think for for this kind of work to be to be uh, extended there. When you mention um, you know five Earths or four Earths of demand in the future, how do you think we're going to provide the food? Presumably, we can continue to increase the yield per acre or hectare, and that means that we don't necessarily have to continuously increase the number of hectares that we're farming. Uh, but obviously, and, and we can reduce the amount of food that goes to feeding the animals too, obviously. Um, but what's the, the sort of combination that seems likely to work? Well, I think a, a, a real, a, a, there really aren't a lot more uh acres or hectares of arable land that we can we can develop so the really the growth would have to be in a in um in the production per hectare the other thing is there's this issue of food waste and a, somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of all food is wasted mm -hmm. so just increasing our efficiencies with how we use the food that we produce is really important uh a much more efficient use of, of irrigation water, uh, things like that are really critical. But I think the key thing is, is these 2.5 billion uh, people involved in, in small farms, which are farms of maybe a half hectare to two hectares in size. And there's a lot of potential there with, with agroecology, permaculture, and so on, to really increase uh, production on those farms without needing ex, uh, to bring in external resources. So without needing to bring in, in expensive fertilizers and pesticides and so on. So I think a lot of potential there on that level. Uh, and I think that's where a lot of attention should be focused. I think, uh, you know, people, and I talk about this quite a bit in, in my book, have figured out uh, really how to, uh, 
systems to transfer funds, and it doesn't have to be large amounts of funds, to those small farmers in green payments to help them kind of transition into, uh, you know, because we're talking about a lot of people here who have uh, an annual income of, you know, uh, maybe three, four, five hundred dollars a year. So a fifty dollar payment to a small farmer could give them enough uh, of a boost to develop these transformative agricultural practices on their small farm, and it would be, you know, actually a fairly minimal amount if we look at expenditures like the military and so on. So uh, I think a lot of hope in in that. But would it be enough to keep them? from moving to the big city where they can earn a thousand, two thousand a year doing something there. I mean, I, it seems to me that's part of the problem too, is that the there's an income disparity between the rural and urban areas that somehow has to be uh, adjusted. So that, I mean, China is gonna have absolutely enormous numbers of huge cities because of the population moving to the cities. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, we really have to, look at that and, and the question of how do we revitalize the village uh, as well as the city and you know the village is where you know close to 50 percent of the world's population still live there uh can we create a kind of village that's a really wonderful place to live you know i think when people transfer themselves into the cities especially at the beginning of their of their transition life can be really really hard and many people regret doing that so uh why are they leaving these these rural communities can and can something like the institute process really help to transform those communities to make them attractive places to live to the point where we might see a, a urban to rural migration mm -hmm. so those are i think those are key issues i think maybe uh you know even things like uh technology and so on might make uh for for rural youth might add to the uh, you know the ability to get an education at the local level to connect with other people around the world that kind of thing uh, so that people don't feel quite as isolated but if you look at that bihar uh, example one of the things you see is is people in the community starting to consult together like youth and elders more instead of just having to do what the elders tell you to do so these kind of things i think make the community more attractive and help maybe keep youth in the community I was in Bolivia some years back, and we visited a little village called Puka Puka, which was a sort of string of houses along the top of a canyon that was mostly Baha'is. And I was quite struck that they could go to Sucre, which was uh, 120 kilometers away. If they could get a ride like on the back of someone's truck, they'd go shopping there. And when they would go shopping, they'd go to the Raul, the Raul Pavon Baha'i Institute They'd use it as their base of operations. They'd bring their stuff back there to store it. And then they would get the ride back from the Raul Pavon Institute back to their village. And their, and their youth would go to the Raul Pavon Institute also to, to, to live in Sucre, take some classes. There was a little dorm. There was, uh, they would cook their own food there. So it was a very interesting cooperative between the big city and a small village that was, a, well, it was a good two hour drive away and those are the kinds of things that really help when you can have these networking you don't have to just go live in the city but you can go visit it and uh, yeah. your kids can go visit for a while and get some education and come back and uh, you can yeah. find out about opportunities and work with development agencies and that kind of thing yeah yeah i think this you know the the kind of mobility of the world's population is is a beautiful thing in some ways but it's also, there's some negative aspects to it. And there's a lot of uh, uh, brain drains from smaller centers and, and, and lower income countries to rich countries and so on, which are, which are quite problematic. And I think, uh, you know, measures that would make these places more, uh, more vital and more attractive to youth and so on are really important. Probably people have all seen this, the new film, Light to the World, and there's one section in there where uh, a gentleman is from Panama, who's a, a Guaymi uh, indigenous person. He talks about how uh, literacy really changed his community. And I had the privilege in 1983 of going to the Guaymi reservation in Panama. And I remember even at that time being kind of 
surprised to see that how, how much more developed the Baha'i community was there than it was where I came from. At that time, there were like 15,000 Baha'is in this community of about 60,000. They had their own, they ran their own schools and there were schools open to everybody. They had radio stations, they had social economic development projects going. And so, you know, I think if, and, and that community was very isolated, like you had to walk into it for a long distance and so on. And, uh, but to see that, that kind of potential developing in there is, I think is really exciting. And maybe it answers some of the, the question we're talking about, about rural development versus urban. Yeah, it's essential because in many places around the world, I mean, when I was in Bolivia, again, I was only there for a week, I was amazed by how much gullying there was from the overuse of the land. Mm -hmm. And if you can't figure out a way to support those rural villages, ultimately, you're going to have some mega cities and a lot of national parks and a lot of abandoned land. And it's was struck me as really a sad situation that would be hard to to avoid, but clearly the Baha'is had their own approach because they were getting development dollars even out in the rural areas and they were taking UNESCO courses together on reading and writing and and and, and counting and, and arithmetic. I was really quite impressed. Yeah. Janet has, and that was 20 years ago, Janet has this interesting question. She says, I think that the earth is already overpopulated. I too grew up in the 50s and negotiating traffic, observing nature, housing options were much more pleasant. Is there anything in the Baha'i writings that speaks to the need for moderation in human population? Our present population already seems excessive. Resigning oneself to 11 billion sounds terrible, sounds horrible. Mm. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm just, uh, <clears throat> I think, conveying what uh, demographers are saying is where population is going. I'm not saying that's a, a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, and as far as the Baha'i writings go, I mean, moderation in all things, I think, is 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 the key there. And uh, I, I think the, you know, there's no way we can really, often I, I get this response that people say, well, we should be reducing our population. Well, who are we going to reduce? Yeah. You know, like, are, are you going to, you know, who's going to volunteer to be the one to reduce or not to have any children and so on? So I think the population is going to go up. There's no doubt about it. <clears throat> but we ultimately have to hit the zero population growth. And you know, the what's if you look at the the project projections for 11 billion, we're talking about 11 billion around there being a peak population because the population growth rate is going down. So probably uh, we're going to get there. Now, mind you, the number of births per woman it just has to go down a little bit, and we may hit it. There could be another scenario where the population growth is quite a bit lower, which would probably be, be make life a lot easier. But there's also a projection where it could be quite a bit higher. Yeah. So if, if we were continuing with the population growth that we had in the first 10 years of this, of this century, if that continued at that level, we'd hit 27 billion by the end of this century. So the 11 billion is already show, is already because population growth is declining. Uh, so uh, it's just, it's, I think it's a reality. We're just heading towards this and we have to deal with it. But, you know, we do, we do need to achieve zero population growth ultimately. Yeah. Um, do you think that renewable energy is sufficient to provide 11 billion people with uh, electricity, with refrigerators, with uh, basic necessities, power necessities, whatever that is. Uh, yeah, I, I do. And, and there's a number of, uh, you know, people have developed scenarios that where this can happen. We're starting to see, I, I mentioned the example, of the article I saw just today in the news of Germany having to pay people to use power because they're producing so much renewable power. Uh, so I think there's a few countries that have really gone down this road. There's a number of countries now who have decided by, let's say, uh, 2030 or 20, between 2030 and 2050 to eliminate fossil fuel use. China's decided to eliminate uh, fossil fuel used vehicles over the next, uh, you know, next several decades. So 
there's a lot of potential and almost all the growth in energy supply is renewable energy these days. So there's very little, uh, in terms of electricity, there's very little new energy from other sources being added. Most of it is renewables. So it's happening, but it's going to take, you, you don't change an energy system overnight. It's going right. to take several decades to do it. <clears throat> uh, Judith has this interesting comment. She says, the earth is fighting back and is certainly not choosy about who is eliminated. Mm. Well, you know, <clears throat> I think people, <clears throat> excuse me, I think people think that, you know, there could be a terrible catastrophe that would reduce the Earth's population. But let's say there was a catastrophe, a horrible catastrophe that took out 100 million people, kind of unimaginable. Well, that, you know, it sounds kind of crass, but that wouldn't even really <laughs> have that much impact on on this total population we're talking about in, in, you know, rising to about 9 billion by the middle of this century and up to 11. So even catastrophic destruction of people wouldn't change the scenario that much and god forbid that that would ever happen uh but you know i think if people don't change if our culture doesn't change then we will see some level of catastrophe that would reduce our population but uh we're we're, we're all kind of working for this this profound cultural change that will help us to avoid that and, and baha'u'llah said that you know we can reduce the severity of the impact of of the change that's coming through our actions we can't eliminate it but we can reduce it well, betty asks this interesting question she says in light of the world in light to the world most of the examples were from rural areas and many of your examples also were rural can you talk about examples among baha'is or any populations in urban areas who are dealing with in a significant way with environmental and other issues yeah um well i mean i think probably uh, even that example of the community in india that we looked at the video now in india maybe that's considered to be a town or village but where i'm from that would probably be the biggest city in, in the country you know it's uh th so there's a lot of activity going on in, in urban areas uh, when we did the course through the Wilmot Institute on agriculture, it was really interesting to see how many of the Baha'is and other people involved in the course were engaged in urban farming mm -hmm. and had projects going on where they were uh, working with, with other players in the community, with schools and so on, to develop urban agriculture and, and local food systems, build food sovereignty and so on. So I, I was quite impressed with that and uh, <clears throat> the number of <clears throat> excuse me, the number of small farmers in, uh, in the U.S. and in Canada who are Baha'is, who were, who were really trying to develop effective systems uh, uh, and contribute to their local food economy. So we're seeing that. I think, uh, you know, Europe is probably at the forefront in terms of building more sustainable communities in cities. And I just provided one example there in the, in the slideshow. But there are, but there are many, and uh, countries like Germany and Denmark and, and the Scandinavian countries are often leaders in those areas in terms of public transportation, sure. uh, food systems, renewable energy, and so on. But interestingly, China is becoming a, a, a real global leader in in many of these areas as well, and they have seen the potential, the potential markets, and so on for renewable energy. And I, apparently, the Chinese feel. Chinese government feels one area where it's very vulnerable is is the area of uh, citizens' uh, concerns about pollution. Mm -hmm. So we are starting to take measures to try and uh, adopt that, such as tran transitioning into electric vehicles. So there are technological fixes that are people are, are trying, but I think the focus that that I've put on, on and I think we need more of is in terms of social technologies, how we organize ourselves as communities. And, uh, and that's really critical because the way, as we become united, we see the results uh, mirrored in the world around us in the, in the physical environment. I think in the developed world, one of the, you might say disadvantages the Baha'i community has is that 
governmental structures are very well established and organized. We can't just create a school because they have to be accredited and those have very high standards and you can't just meet under a tree because the, there are a lot of better options. And in other parts of the world, things are not quite that advanced and therefore the Baha'is are in the position to uh, sort of provide a breakthrough and provide a foundational set of institutions. <clears throat> and seemingly that's one of the differences too. Yeah, I, agree. I don't see any more questions, but I'll ask one more question so that people have a chance to ask a question. And that's, uh, have we any idea, you know, that in what is 1817 or so, there was a, what they call the year without summer, when a volcanic eruption basically eliminated summer for much of the Northern Hemisphere. Something like that, it seems to me, in our highly <laughs> developed agricultural systems around the world would have an enormous potential for uh, wreaking havoc with the world's food supply. Yes, uh, certainly would. <laughs> that, yeah. that, that kind of disaster, you know, if it happens, well, you know, nobody can predict it and, and uh, there could be devastating consequences from that. Somehow, though, doesn't it seem that, <laughs> that people survive? Like when that happened, I, I don't know what level of population decline there was. I think just people suffered. There probably was a certain amount of, of death but people it was probably more people suffered through yeah and we probably learn an awful lot about how little we can get by on yeah that's true well when that happened for the united states i suspect the population density was low enough so people could go out and you know shoot more deer and raccoons and such yeah. uh, and fish in the river a little more and uh make up part of the deficit that way but that kind of solution doesn't exist as much nowadays yeah. Um, I don't see any other questions, and uh, we've certainly gone quite a long time, so perhaps, oh, here's another one. Uh, well, Judith is asking about uh, plagues also, um, um, and I guess we've got pretty good health systems now for controlling that, but um, you never know. Christine also has said, in the developed world, people are often comfortable and don't see the need to change as much as in poor countries. The Universal House of Justice asks the Baha'is to turn away from consumerism, but it's often difficult to understand what that means. There's a new six week course for the Baha'i junior youth on the story of stuff that helps to raise awareness about that. And that's, that's something that was developed partly with people through uh, the Wilmot Institute courses on sustainable development. So that's a very good uh, point that, that um, that, that people can use that. Uh, yeah, I think that this is a, I think this whole question of, you know, of what is development? And, and I think we in, in this uh, part of the world think of, you know, that the poor need development. And I think probably most of the problem, the type of problem I'm talking about in, <clears throat> in this book really is, are caused by the, the more wealthy people, the, probably the top 20% of the world's population in terms of income are the cause of most of the environmental problems that we're facing, especially something like climate change. Uh, so uh, really the need for transformation to occur at the level of, um, of, of the, you know, at the wealthy nations, the, the wealthy and the middle class is really, really critical. But I think, I think that uh, Christine is right that it really is, uh, you know, we think we're okay because uh, we have, generally speaking, we tend to have what we need. So uh, probably people who are a little more vulnerable are more open to change than we are. And I, I certainly uh, don't see a huge amount of interest in something like the, the Institute process where I live, which is a fairly affluent city. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I don't think people kind of get that we we need to change and maybe we're the ones that need to change the most. Yeah, yeah. Um, Janet asks whether the charts uh, that were in the PowerPoints would be available and are we, are we able to make your PowerPoint available on our website? Uh, 
Well, it's okay with me, but it's going to be that YouTube. It's going to be on YouTube, so I guess that would be the the best way to to deal with it. Yeah, uh, a lot of the charts are in the book, and uh, yeah, good. Well, I want to thank you again. Uh, this was really a fantastic uh, web talk, and I think one that we'll be thinking about for really quite a long time. Um, one that will, I, I hope, help us change our view of the world and a view of our own consumption and help us think of ways that we can uh, sort of move our whole society forward and, uh, and consume less. I want to mention our upcoming web talks. Uh, we have three in the next three Sundays by Robert Atkinson, as you can see here. The first one from Duality Oneness of Baha'i Perspective on Humanity's Conscious Evolution. Then we have The Dark Night of the, of the Collective Soul on November 12th. And Reality is One and Global Harmony is Inevitable on November 19th. Then on December 3rd, Elena Mustakova Posart will be giving us a sort of psychologically oriented web talk, a psychology that responds to our times transforming inner oppression into awakened, aligned, and liberated spirit. So we're looking forward to these four presentations in the next five weeks. We're going to be quite busy um, in the next month uh, with web presentations, all of which, of course, will be on our YouTube. Uh, if you want to know more about our upcoming courses, here's a list. Sharing Baha'u'llah's birthday with children is really over. Um, so that one I should have dropped. Uh, choosing a potential marriage partner starts on the 31st, and then this very course on uh, the book 11 begins on November 1st, and we already have a good uh, number of people who will happily welcome a lot more, of course. A uh, course on the covenants of the Baha'i faith and the course on summons of the Lord of hosts coming up also in the first week of November. Then uh, Secret of Divine Civilization, Abdul Baha's uh, own exposition on how to create a better civilization and a course on the equality of men and women starting on 1115. So the Woman Institute has a lot coming up and we hope many of you will consider registering for some of these courses. Again, we wanna thank uh, Paul Hanley very much for his present today, presentation today on his book 11. And we look forward to seeing all of you at our future web talks uh, in the next few weeks. Thank you everybody for participating.